Thank you for being here. My name is Charlotte Gilbride, and I'm the coordinator of the Nancy R. Chandler Visiting Scholar Program at COCC Foundation. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to silence or turn off your cell phones. I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight as we host the 11th annual season of nonviolence. We are pleased with the response to this program. We are so thrilled to have Judge Torres with us tonight. We're in for a treat. As many of you know, especially those of you who have attended these events over the last 11 years, COCC Season of Nonviolence honors the legacies of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Muhammad Gandhi, Cesar Chavez, and Chief Wilma Mankiller. The season is part of an international campaign that remembers the work of Dr. King and Gandhi for their vision of an empowered, nonviolent world. The season spans the anniversary of their assassination dates, January 30th to April 4th. And thus, this time frame is designated as a time to reflect on their work to end oppression and to restore equality and respect for everyone. At COCC, we have also included Cesar Chavez and Chief Wilma Mankiller in the commemoration of the season of nonviolence because of their important contributions for justice and equality. And obviously, there are many more. Many more who have spoken out, stood up, voted, marched on behalf of justice and equity for all. So this series is dedicated to all of them and to all of us. One thing that you may have seen in the slides that I wanted to announce is there's been a play written about Judge Torres's life. And it's um, the play is the, the play company is based in Portland, correct? And COCC and OSU Cascades are bringing the play to town. <laughs> so that will be on May 16th. So look for marketing materials on that. Avelia has more information too. But um, it's going to be, I believe, in Hitchcock. On, it's a Thursday night. So really cool. I mean, can you imagine having a play written about your life? <laughs> So without any further ado, I'd love to introduce our speaker tonight. Ciamora Torres was born in El, Salva El Salvador and immigrated to the United States at nine years old, speaking no English. She settled in California, where she spent time in the California foster care system until she aged out at 18. She was the first in her family to attend college, graduating from the University of California, Berkeley, with a degree in sociology in 1991. She graduated from Lewis and Clark Law School in 2002, and she's been a member of the Oregon State Bar since 2003. Prior to her 2017 appointment to the Multnomah County Circuit Court, Ju Circuit Court Judge Torres was a senior assistant attorney general in the Oregon Department of Justice where she has served for more than a decade. She worked in the department's child's advocacy section and represented the state in juvenile dependency cases. She began her legal career handling indigent juvenile defense cases at a small private law firm. She served as a judicial law clerk to Multnomah County Circuit Court's judge, Julie Franz. When she was appointed to Multnomah Co County Court, County Circuit Court Judge, Governor Kate Brown was quoted saying, Xiomara Torres has spent her career fighting for Oregon's most vulnerable children. I know she will bring to Multnomah County bench the experience, the talent, and the heart to make a significant contribution to the Portland community. She is the past chair of the Oregon Minority Law Lawyers Association and has served on the board of the Oregon Hispanic Bar Association. She has also served on the Multnomah Bar Association's Court Liaison Committee and is currently serving on the Multnomah Bar Foundation Board of Directors. She's amazingly fun and energetic and smart, and let me please introduce Judge Torres. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. So first, I'm a lot of things, but not technologically savvy. So I need to make sure this is working. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, 
That was a very uh, sweet introduction. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I'm, I'm so amazed that people come out and they want to hear my story because um, I feel like everyone has a story and so mine doesn't necessarily feel particularly more different than anyone else's. Uh, so thank you for being interested in hearing about me. And I want to thank Charlotte, and I want to obviously um, thank Avilia for having the idea to bring me out here. I love it here. I usually try to make it out here at least one time during the summer. And I want to thank the Nancy Chandler Visiting Scholar Program for making this possible. As I was uh, debating about what I would talk to you about tonight, um, I decided that I'm actually going to uh, present two very different uh, speeches to you. So the first speech is going to be the speech that I ordinarily gave a long time ago whenever I was invited to places and people wanted to know uh, about my life and about uh, being a lawyer and about going to law school. People would ask me, hey, come talk and you come to the school and talk to students. And so I had this prepared speech that I always gave and it, I call it very professional and clinical. So first I'm going to give you that speech, and then I'm going to give you a different speech, and then you're going to, I'm going to explain to you the difference in the speeches. So this first speech really kind of tracks the bio that, was, uh, that you were told about earlier, and that is my education. I went to Montebello High School in Los Angeles, and I graduated from there. I see a little hands up over there. Yay. <laughs> and I spent two years there. I actually moved around a lot growing up, and you're going to hear about that later. And so that was the high school that I graduated from. Um, somehow, somewhere along the way, I took an exam, and apparently I scored very high in math and science. And because I scored so, math, so high in math and science, I learned this in college, um, Berkeley uh, wrote me a letter and said, we want you to come to school here. And they wanted me to do their engineering program. Um, I was not interested in engineering at all, no offense to engineers. Uh, but I wanted to work with people, and I didn't really think engineering would be the avenue for me. So, you know, I was 17, and I thought, well, I'm going to apply to Berkeley anyway and see if they'll let me in. Because since I'm turning them down on engineering, I'm hoping that they'll still take me in if I want to study something else. And at the time, I thought I wanted to be a psychologist. So I applied to Berkeley. I did get in. Of course, you know, I was a teenager, so by that time I had changed my mind about Berkeley altogether, and I wanted to go to a different school, so Berkeley was actually my second choice. I wanted to go to Wellesley, and um, because I kind of thought, I loved the concept of a, a school that had primarily all women, and that could really nurture your mind. So I applied to Wellesley, they turned me down, and uh, actually, they turned me down for the first semester, and they said, you can come in spring because they'll have kids, you know, kids will drop out. And so I thought about that, but I didn't want to wait all summer and a whole semester and start in the spring, and you're going to hear later about why I really couldn't do that. And so, uh, people make fun of me, so I went to my back at school, Berkeley, and, uh, <laughs> and that's where I ended up going to college, and I decided to study sociology. I, again, changed my mind several times. I used to keep this journal um, that someone gave to me, and I would write down what I wanted to be. And at 19, I, it changed almost weekly. And so uh, I finally decided I wanted to work with children. I knew I definitely wanted to work with children. And I was trying to find the best avenue to do that. Um, so when I graduated from Berkeley, um, and I took a big break from Berkeley. So I was there for two years, and then I took three years off because I was struggling there. It was a huge university. I had really no familial support, and it was hard. And so I took a big break and worked for a while, and honestly, I wasn't even sure that I was going to go back. A lot of people don't go back when they take a break. And so I was worried about that, and somehow I managed to go back and um, finished up and graduated with a degree in sociology. So after I went to Berkeley, I started working at law firms, trying to decide if law was going to be what I wanted to do. And it turned out that um, with some encouragement from someone that you're going to hear a lot about later, her name is Jan Bryce, I decided to go to law school and I applied to Lewis and Clark, primarily because, uh, one, a friend of mine that 
but lived in Portland, lived in the city of Aloha, said, if you love the campus at Berkeley so much, you should really look at Lewis and Clark because it's beautiful. So I really chose it primarily for the campus. <laughs> and then, but I did my research because I research a lot. Um, Lewis and Clark had uh, one of the highest uh, percentage rates of their graduates going into public interest. And I knew I wanted to go into public interest. And so I wanted a, a, a law school that would channel um, all my energy into trying to find me a job in the public interest sector. So I went to Lewis and Clark, loved it. Um, I found the rain was actually quite peaceful uh, during a very stressful setting, which was studying uh, and trying to pass your classes in law school because it's a terrifying exhibit uh, experience, but I recommend it to everyone somehow. Um, because uh, we need lawyers, even though people think we have too many, we don't. And so um, I went to Lewis and Clark, and then after the first year at Lewis and Clark, I actually, sadly enough, thought about going back to California and abandoning Oregon, which I can't even imagine now. And so I took a job the first summer working with the uh, California Attorney General's office. And I was based in San Francisco. So I worked there during the summer, primarily reviewing Army Corps of Engineer documents all summer long. Didn't meet lawyers because it was so huge. And they wanted me to transfer to a California law school. That was the, the sort of the award of the job that they gave you was you would transfer to a California school because they ordinarily would not hire students who were not California law students. So that was what I was going to do, but I changed my mind. I decided I was in downtown San Francisco, and I love downtown San Francisco, but it had no trees. And I, I, I couldn't live without the beauty of the state. So I came back and finished up, and of course I took the bar here, didn't pass the bar the first time. I tell a lot of law students this because uh, people are surprised that you can become a judge and not have passed the bar the first time. Uh, but it was on my birthday, and I really resented that. <laughs> and, so, and so, anyway, I didn't pass. So then the second time, I took it in February, and I studied really hard. I went every single day and treated it like a job, and I passed the second time. And then after I, I finished law school, I worked for, I was lucky enough to get a job. Uh, I was interning during law school with a federal judge. Um, Anna Brown, and she was magnificent to work for. She's an incredible mentor. And so I worked with her during the summer, and they offered me uh, the ability to stay on for the year. So I interned with her for a year. Uh, and then after um, I did graduate from law school, I took a full-time job working as a law clerk for Chief Criminal Judge Julie France. Uh, another incredible experience watching this incredible judge juggle motherhood and being a judge. And so, um, and then when I finally passed the bar, second time, I um, applied to be a lawyer for kids and parents in child abuse cases. So I went to work with a law firm, Bertoni and Todd. I worked there for four years. And after my four years there, I was burnt out. The, um, having, human, having humans struggle in their lives and tell you about it and lose their kids and hear about drugs and their struggles staying clean and having it in your office was a lot. And so after four years, I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't have a job lined up, um, and so I quit. And uh, four months later, uh, I was lucky enough that the uh, Oregon Attorney General's office hired me. I had applied there before once, and they hadn't hired me. Uh, and then um, when another job came up, I applied. And so I went to work with the trial division, and I was representing the state in a variety, uh, you represent a variety of different agencies learning civil law, which I was practicing uh, juvenile law, so I had to switch gears and learn all about civil law. And so that's what I did, and then I switched from the trial division uh, about a year and a half later and went to work for what's called their child advocacy section. Um, when I was representing parents and kids, um, sometimes if I represented the kids, the kids wanted to stay home, so I would work really hard to make sure the children did not get removed from their parents' home. If I was representing parents, I was working really hard to get their children back. Um, and sometimes I was representing them in what's called uh, termination of parental rights trials. Parents have about a year to get their children back. 
And if they do not succeed in services, the state can come in and do a termination action. So I was representing parents and defending them in those actions. When I switched to the child advocacy section at Department of Justice, I was on the other side of those cases. So I was representing the state, and I was handling the termination cases and doing the trials where I was seeking to terminate parental rights of parents. Um, and so it was a big change, and um, some friends thought I had sold out and that I was not helping kids anymore. I disagree. I think that I was making, in my mind, a big difference in a larger scale. And then after a decade at the Department of Justice, I applied to be a judge. Um, one of my friends had become the legal counsel to Governor Kitzhaber at the time, and so I thought, you know, I'm just going to apply and see what happens. I um, was offered an interview with a panel of 14 people, terrifying experience. Uh, one of the Court of Appeal judges was in that panel, and uh, so I interviewed, I didn't advance. Uh, the second time around, I decided, I'm going to try again, I think it was about maybe two years later, and this time we had a new governor, Governor Kate Brown, and they offered me the panel interview again. I went in, somehow I ended up in the top two, was fully vetted, they did background check, they talked to your neighbors, they asked your neighbors if you yell at your children, which I do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> they asked if you borrow things without asking, I hadn't done that, so thank God. <laughs> and um, I came in the top two, I didn't get selected, and then after that I thought, well, maybe I'm not meant to be a judge. You know, and I loved my job, I loved my colleagues, so I thought, well, I'm gonna just finish out at the Department of Justice. And I decided, I actually decided, well, maybe I'll try one more time, and I'll put in, and I, I tried a different county. Instead of Multnomah County, I tried in Washington County, which has a really high Latino population, and I thought they could really use a Hispanic judge. And so I applied there, I didn't get, not even an interview. So I thought, okay, well, this is weird. So, because I did so well last time, so I didn't get an interview, and then after that I thought, okay, now I'm going to stop. So that was three times I tried, and it's not working, and that's okay, um, and maybe it's just not my calling. And then they called. Uh, literally, they called. Uh, a judge uh, decided to retire, and Governor Brown's office called and said she'd like to interview you, and here I am. And so she appointed me. So that's the story that everyone gets. That's the story of my professional and educational background. And then somehow it all changed. And the reason why it changed, and I'm gonna tell you, and I don't share this with a lot of people, but the reason it changed is because one time I was at home and I was watching TV, and I was watching DACA kids on TV and they were protesting. And they were just wearing shirts saying they were illegal marking themselves saying illegal and they're protesting because they want a right to have an education. And I was blown away watching that. I, I could not even imagine in my mind the bravery that that took. And it struck me, it, it, it stayed with me for a long time after that. And so um, I get appointed and the Oregonian wants to do a profile. I'm a new judge, they say, hey, can we interview you? I'm like, sure. So they come, they, they talk to me, I think I'm going to tell them everything I just told you. Except the reporter was really good. And she asked me, how did you get here? Where did you fly into? Except I didn't fly into this country. And I have a reporter who's asking, who's going to be really good at fact checking. And I am honest, and so I tell her, oh, actually I actually didn't fly in here. I came in through a river and we had a coyote. You should have seen her face, because I don't think she was expecting that answer. So she talks to me for about an hour after that, and then I think I had like seven more interviews with the Oregonian after that, and before the profile came out. And uh, of course, I consider myself a really smart person, so I called the governor's office and I said, hey, uh, by the way, the governor's office didn't know this, because when you apply to be a judge, they ask you if you're a U.S. citizen. I'm a U.S. citizen. So they don't ask you how you got here. <laughs> so I say to them, you know, the Oregonian wants to do this story. I actually sent a text message to the lawyer, to the, her lawyer, and I said, um, an immigrant kid who crosses the river, it's not documented, and becomes a judge is too much for the governor. <laughs> 
Luckily, they say, not too much. And I'm like, are you sure? Because the Oregonian is scaring me. They're telling me they can pull the story if I want them to. So now they're making me think that I probably shouldn't do this story. <laughs> and I'm a new judge, and I'm talking to people, and I'm thinking, ooh, am I doing the right thing? Um, but you know, the thing is, I was just telling the story of my life. And I thought, I'm in a position now where the only thing I could lose by being completely open about how I got to this country and about my life is a contested race. Someone could run against me. And if that happens, and if someone, if I lose the seat, then I'll go back and be a, a lawyer again. I love being a lawyer. I love advocating. I love trials. So I'll do that. But I thought about those DACA kids, and I thought they had so much to lose. They could be forced out, and all they want is an education. And here I am in a position where all I would lose is a judicial position. So then I just talked to the Oregonian, and I don't think I ever stopped talking to them. I think that they were like in my office all the time. And so they did this profile. And that's how people found out that I uh, had arrived to this country um, and had, uh, didn't have documents. And, um, I was a judge, and you know, of course I was prepared for criticism. How can you enforce laws if you broke the law? Which is an interesting concept because they were going, was really good about making sure that people knew that there is no such law on the books that, and that children, there's no criminal liability for children um, when your parents bring you over. So that's sort of how it all started, which is how the play started as well. Someone read the story and decided to make a play, which is the most bizarre thing to have, is a play about your life. <laughs> I'm still kind of, I'm still getting used to being a judge, and it's been two years, so I'm still now also getting used to having a play about my life. Um, but the reason I tell you all this now is that it's been so, um, how can I say, it's been so, freeing to say, I came to this country without documents. My parents brought me, we lived in El Salvador, and there was a civil war. A lot of people don't know about the civil war in El Salvador. I, I always want to learn things, so I learned a lot about it. In college, I signed up for a bunch of classes so I could study what was going on in Latin America, why we needed to leave. So there was a 12-year civil war, and I'm going to make it super long, don't worry. But there was a 12-year civil war. The wealth was concentrated in these families, 17 families. And um, people were, the people were fighting with the government guerrillas. Uh, my family, interestingly enough, was on both sides. My mother's family was quite affluent, so her family really sided with the government. My father's side of the family was not affluent. And so it, within my home, they were different sectors. Uh, but my father worked for the government. He did telegrams. And so he was getting telegrams about who was going to get killed. And he started telling people. So he had to flee very quickly. So that's how um, he came first, and then we came after. And um, he was in the process of doing political asylum at work, you know, the, the paperwork for that, and so was my mother. And we had been in this country for, I think, three years. And then unfortunately, I experienced sex abuse, and I had to be placed in foster care. I was placed in four foster homes over the lifetime of my time in care. And, you know, I don't really share that with a lot of people before. Now I, I'm really open to talking about it. When I was working at the Department of Justice, I think I told two bosses about it. And um, when I first decided to apply to be a judge, I met with someone from the governor's office and I said to him, you know, I was in foster care, and he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. Like, what, two months? I'm like, oh, actually, I was in foster care from 13 to 18. And he's like, oh, you were really in foster care. <laughs> oh, yeah, so it was a long time. And so he was like, you've never mentioned it. And I never really mentioned it before to people because, as you can understand, I was representing children, and I was representing parents, and some parents had, were charged with sex abuse crimes, and I was representing them. And I never wanted people to think that anything about my personal life would impact my ability to do my job, which is to be a good lawyer. And so I never mentioned it. 
And um, then when I went to work for the state and I was doing the termination cases, I never wanted people to think, because of her experiences, she's going after these cases or she's going after you know, a parent who maybe did sex abuse cases. So I was so worried. I wanted to, I, my professional reputation meant so much to me that I didn't want people to ever think that I was biased in one way or another because I wanted to do a really good job. And so I just never really talked about it. But then once I decided I'm going to tell people about my life, I'm in a position as a judge where people are going to want to know about my life and they are going to want to learn from it. And so that's when I decided I'm going to be as honest as I want to be and I'm going to tell people everything. And it is honestly one of the best decisions I ever made because I don't carry any secrets. And people ask me, well, how did you deal with all this adversity? And that's the part that I think is the beautiful part in the story, is I have a court-appointed special advocate. Her name is Jan Bryce. And um, she I was appointed to me when I came into foster care. And she, through, she's still very close to me. She's like a mom to me. And she made sure to always be there for me. And she went to every graduation. She was at my wedding. She was there when my children were born. And she has been by my side the entire time as a mentor and as this great spirit. And to me, I always tell her this, and she doesn't believe it. She takes no credit for my success at all. Uh, but what I tell her is, I wouldn't be here without her. And if she ever intended, as a court-appointed special advocate, as a CASA, to make a difference in children's lives, she's made a difference in one. And to me, volunteering and being there for other people is the most important thing that we can do in our society. We sometimes forget about people. And I will be honest with you, it is hard to ask for help. And sometimes we have to be there for people even when they don't ask for help. And we have to keep showing up. And that to me, so when, when they said, hey, we want to do this play about you, at first I was like, I don't know, I've been so public already and I don't even know if judges are supposed to be this public, but I get the feeling they're not. So I kind of feel like I just need to like sit and do my job and be quiet. And uh, then they say, hey, but you know, we want kids to learn about you and we want to take uh, the play to different schools and have kids learn uh, about adversity and how you can reach your goals. And of course, I'm a sucker for kids, so I'm like, okay. So that's how I agreed to do the play. And um, um, I, I'm touched that you're bringing it here. Um, it is, be prepared, uh, it's a very emotional play. I wasn't expecting that. So it's been really weird to have my friends cry all the time. <laughs> and uh, I've been telling them, like, you know, we warn them. Uh, so I think the reason why it's such an emotional play is um, I had the great opportunity to work with the playwright and they sent me drafts and I could make changes. And I think what she captures is um, the human struggle. That same struggle that I didn't want in my office, we all have it. And I think the play captures it and it sends a variety of different messages about immigrants, learning about immigrants. Uh, it sends a message about trauma and um, surviving trauma. And then it sends the message. The one thing I told the playwright was, I need the play to be, um, I need to make sure that you make it very clear what a significant impact this one person has had. And so make sure that that comes through and I will leave you alone. And I think that I sent a couple of emails here and there, but for the most part, I gave them a lot of artistic license. And so there are sections of the play that, will not, that are not true, that they made up. Um, and, um, but I, my goal was, and I think it came through, um, is that you can make an impact on people. And we just need one. Mm -hmm. And if you can make an impact on one, then I think um, your work here is done. Mm -hmm. So. What I strive for now as a judge is I'm trying to make an impact on one. So as these kids, I, I have a lot of delinquency cases that come before me, uh, children on probation. 
And you know, you read these files and you read what um, the state has been able to prove that they've done and you read that they are on probation as I'm taking over cases from a previous judge. And then you read these files and then you come out, you take the bench and you have a 14 year old sitting in front of you and you're reminded what 14 year olds look like. And they're babies. And so I'm charged now with making decisions about these children. And I am really open with the kids as well. What you're hearing now, this new side of me that's so open now, I'm really open with the kids um, because I want to make sure that they know, especially kids in foster care, um, if there are kids coming in front of me that just got placed to a new home and they're adjusting, I tell them, you know what, I know what that's like because I was in foster care. And you should see the way they look at you because they know you get it. They know that you know exactly what it's like to go from one home to another. And then the kids that are being challenged and maybe not uh, complying with probation, I tell them, what's not working? Like, tell me what's missing. Like, what are we not doing to reach you? What is your challenge here? And so I, I can't say that I'm always successful in getting kids to talk to me, but I'm trying because my goal is to reach one. And that's so far um, what I've been trying to do. I am, as I said, I'm adjusting. I'm adjusting to this very public persona that um, I'm actually extremely private, and I, I was saying I hate pictures. <laughs> so <laughs> I was always like during Christmas, people had to beg to get one picture, uh, even after kids. Uh, and so this has been uh, a very different role. I love my job as a judge. Um, I'm honored that I'm trusted with the responsibility to make decisions. But the rest of it, the very public figure, of course I know I'm guilty because I've added to that, but the very public figure has been difficult. Um, but I think uh, one of the things, I just got a letter from a child that, I was telling someone earlier, from a child that watched the play that went to Roosevelt High School. And she wrote that she had never, she lives in Multnomah County, which is the county where I sit. And she wrote that she didn't know that we had a Latina judge. And that bothered me. That bothered me that I'm right there and that there are kids who don't know that there's a judge that looks like them sitting on that bench. And so another reason why it made me, because um, of course I second guess all my, myself all the time. In fact, um, the day after the play, um, I was watching the play and 14 judges came supporting me. because I have incredible colleagues. And, um, the next day I texted one of my judge friends and I'm like, did I really let them do a play about my life story? <laughs> so trust me, I question myself all the time. But that letter from that kid made me think, you know what, that was the right choice. That was the right choice for me because uh, she also wrote about adversity and she said, it makes me think that I can overcome things that I'm dealing with and reach my goals. So again, you know, this, the interesting thing to me is that I think a play can be made about just about anyone. I think we all have these adversities and we all overcome them and become successful in our lives. We just don't talk about it. And uh, I don't, I mean, I don't blame you. Some of this stuff is really personal, so you don't want to talk about it. But I don't really think that my story is much different than other people, probably in this room. And so, uh, maybe not the foster care part, because that, like, that part, I will tell you, that's what I tell foster kids. Like, if I have a foster kid that's four credits away from graduating from high school, mm -hmm. I tell them about the statistics. I know that foster children end up homeless, they don't graduate from high school, and so I tell them, you're so close, I need you to be part of my statistic. I need you to be in my group. I need to make sure that you graduate. So you're four credits away. Come on, we can do this. So let's check in, see where we're at next time you come, because you need to be in my group. I need to make sure you're not part of the other statistics. And so the foster care piece, um, again, something that I was extremely shy about. And you know, I think about that. Why was I so shy about talking about all these things until I saw this inspiring thing on these kids who really wanted an education? And I think it's because being a foster kid uh, comes with a lot of shame. Kids think they've done something wrong when they haven't. 
And so they don't want to talk about it. Also, I think we want to fit in as kids. And so you don't want anyone to think you're different than anyone else. So you don't want to talk about it. Uh, being um, surviving abuse. Again, you don't want to seem like in any way like you're a victim or you don't want to seem in any way like you're weak and you can't deal with things. So you don't talk about it. But, you know, the, the interesting thing for me was that between the Oregonian story where I just called it abuse and I didn't talk about what it was, uh, and the play was that I made the difference to talk about it. And the reason why I made the difference, that I made that choice for myself was the Me Too movement. Um, I was so inspired to hear men and women talk about experience that they had that had been so challenging. And I couldn't believe it as I was hearing it. And like I said, both men and women, and they're talking about these experiences. And I thought, well, that's interesting, because I really was not that brave the first time I talked to the Oregonian. So when the playwright approached me and said, can you talk about the abuse? Can we cover that? I said, OK. You know, I've, I, I think I want to do that. And so um, you're, the play is very uh, raw in that sense. It's very carefully done. It's, uh, this play is going to middle schools, so um, it's very discreetly done. But I think that's part of the reason why it's so emotional, because it touches on that. It touches about being a foster kid. And um, watching the play for me, and I'm, I feel like I'm plugging this thing, and I don't mean to. <laughs> but the, the reason why I think it was so emotional is that, for me, is that as a foster kid, you never lose that label, by the way, but as a foster kid, I couldn't believe I was watching a play about children experiencing foster care and talking about what it's like to be in foster care. And then I thought, that's going to go to schools. And so kids who maybe don't know what a foster child is, they're going to learn about what that experience is like. And so that was powerful to me to see. And then um, I also told the playwright and the artistic director, I don't think I, I see a lot of plays because I love the arts. And I said to her, I don't know that I've ever gone to a play that covered the crossing over the river by immigrants. At least I haven't. Mm -hmm. And so it, you know, the play covers um, my two siblings. I actually have um, one more sibling, but we only have four actors. So uh, you, it, it shows some of my siblings and I crossing the river and coming into this country. And for me, that was also powerful because I haven't seen that. And so um, I'm going to just leave you with this. For me, the things that I haven't seen is what I want to show people now. So I want people to see diverse judges. I want people to see judges with life experiences. And us being really open, the judges are so not very accessible when we think about them because they're not supposed to be, because we make decisions for people and we want you to listen to us and follow those decisions and those orders. So we don't share a lot. But I think, at least for me, I want to share a lot because I want you to know the kind of person that is being entrusted with those decisions. And then I want kids to know that they can be judges despite whatever circumstances they may have faced, whatever struggles, whatever they're going through in trying to get their own education. I want them to know that there's, it can, it's a goal that you can reach. And, um, but I don't think that I got here alone. Uh, aside from my CASA, I had amazing teachers that always encouraged me to go to school and to do well and to continue and to go to college. And uh, I had amazing friends with amazing families that always let me come into their home and uh, gave me lots of love. I still keep in touch with my best friend from high school. And I was fortunate, because somehow I was able to take him to college with me, because Berkeley was also his backup school. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to go to college at William and Mary, and he didn't get in. So those are tough schools, Wellesley and William and Mary. So I got to take my best friend, and um, that was an incredible support. And his family's always been tremendously supportive of me as well. And so that's my story. I'm giving you the real story and not the clinical, what I call the clinical story that I always gave before. Because I think that's the most important one. And I am hopeful that people can start sharing their stories. 
Because I think that's the only way we learn from each other and really learn about how we all struggle. And so if you take away nothing from this speech but that, it would make me very happy. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I think, I feel like I told you everything, so I can't imagine what questions you could possibly have. I bet you have questions. But I will take questions. <laughs> yeah, so we have two microphones. We'll come run to you so everybody can hear the question. Let us know if you don't and you want Judge Torres to repeat the question. Does anybody have a question? We have one over here. Um, I'm a CASA, and I've often wondered from the child standpoint, what was your view of the foster care system going through it? Well, I was in foster care in California, so obviously it's, um, at the time it was uh, different. Um, you know, I talked to my CASA a lot about that because um, at the time that I was going through it, there was very little support for children aging out. So they didn't have all the independent living programs. Um, they didn't have all these classes to help you learn how to set up a checking account. They didn't have all the support to help you learn to drive. I actually didn't learn to drive until much later in life. And so as you're moving from home to home, you may not get that class, and you may not have someone to practice with. And so that support was not there. What she was telling me is nowadays, and she did it for 27 years, nowadays, and I know obviously firsthand in Oregon, I know that that support system is there, and there's a lot of subsidies and a lot of scholarships. Um, but in California at the time, there was very little support. And so it's not surprising to me um, that um, children end up homeless, that foster kids end up homeless. And that's actually um, one of the major things that you will, if you see the play, you'll see about is that um, one of the reasons why I couldn't wait for Wellesley was because I didn't have a place to live. So once I aged out, I needed to go to college immediately. Uh, I couldn't wait till spring. That was impossible to, for me. And so that support system was not in place. And uh, things are changing, and I'm really hopeful um, with regards. The more we educate people about uh, the needs of foster kids, I think the more and, um, the CASA program and just volunteering in general. You know, uh, the biggest obstacle that I'm seeing as a judge is foster homes. We don't have foster homes. And it is such a struggle to place children. We just don't have the homes. And I'm not saying that it's easy to be a foster parent, because it's not. It's a, it's a tremendous challenge, and some of these children are very challenging, and they will, be, they will have mental health issues, and some will be angry, and some will be defiant, and you're dealing with a lot, so it's not for everyone. And we desperately need foster parents. Thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so you mentioned second-guessing yourself. So how do you deal with repetitive rejection and feel that you love? Uh, like for you being a judge, and how do you strive to be better despite that rejection? You know, now I'm helping people because um, I have a lot of friends who want to be judges. For some reason, everyone wants to be a judge. And so, <laughs> it is a great job. Um, and so, now I help friends who are being rejected. Like a friend of mine just got turned down to be a judge, and this is his second time applying. And so, I'm writing him emails and I'm calling him and being supportive. And um, a judge told me, I had lunch with this one judge that I didn't know very well in the county where I couldn't even get an interview. So I joke with those judges now because they say, we wish you'd come to Washington County. And I'm like, you wouldn't even give me an interview. <laughs> but um, I had lunch with one of those judges and she said to me, you will find that being a judge is a calling. And so that's how I see it. You deal with rejection, but if it's truly what you were meant to do, then you just have to keep trying. And even if you don't want to try, you're gonna, it's gonna, the right path is gonna happen. And so that's what I tell my friends. And if it's not, if you don't become a judge, then maybe you're meant to do something else. Something even more meaningful, more impactful in a different way. So that's how I deal with rejection, and that's how I help friends deal with rejection. I think you're over here. How did you pay for college and law school? Thank you. Uh, I'm still paying for college and law school. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so, uh, undergrad, 
Uh, actually, you know, they just did a study about that, like they, they, a survey about the judges because they wanted to find out how many judges were still paying for their education because Oregon is one of the lowest, uh, has one of the uh, lowest paid uh, judges in the country, and so they're looking at that. Um, but in undergrad, I was, I had gone from temporary resident and I was in the process later to do permanent residence so I could qualify for federal grants and state grants. And also I was at Berkeley, so Berkeley is a state school. It wasn't as expensive as some of the private schools. So maybe it was a, you know, a blessing that I didn't go to Wellesley because I had no idea how I would have paid for that. And then um, when I went to law school, I had a dean's fellowship that, I, that they offered me when I started. And, um, but the rest of it was loans. So that's what I'm still working on. <laughs> I think I saw, yes. Uh, can you talk personally about that dynamic of uh, a judge with a spouse, uh, the male-female dynamic uh, that has shaped you, formed you, and continues? I guess I want clarification on the dynamic. Um, so male, female, like the the, the ratio. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you know, I went to see a swearing-in ceremony in Washington County, and I don't mean to speak ill of Washington County. I feel like I am, and I'm not. There are some amazing uh, judges there that I really like. But I went to a swearing-in ceremony of one of them, and it just so happened that their female judges were in court hearings, and so I'm sitting with someone. And as they, the judges do a, a, a procession, so as the judges come in in their robes and everyone stands, it's all males. And so the gentleman that I'm with, he says to me, do they not have any female judges? And they do, but they definitely could use more. And, um, but that was very impactful to see all male judges come in. Um, Multnomah County actually has a very good ratio of male and females, uh, not in family law, in juvenile law, and family law, which is what I do, oddly enough, it's mostly females. So I actually think we need more male judges. I think especially when we're trying to reach uh, males who are in, correct, in the juvenile system, I feel like male judges could have a really incredible impact. So for family law, I'm recruiting male judges. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, overall, I do think we need um, more female judges in the federal bench. It's almost non-existent in Oregon and in the Court of Appeals. And I was just, I'm ashamed to say that I just started reading Sotomayor's book, Justice Sotomayor's book. Um, and uh, she's only the third in the Supreme Court. So um, how do I deal with it? I think we have amazing male colleagues who see that we need female judges, who see the value. And they also see the value in judges who have diverse experiences. So um, I feel extremely supported in Multnomah County by the judges who have been extremely welcoming and um, mentoring. And, and then the newer judges, that, uh, I'm almost like a senior judge, it's really strange, because I've only been there two years, but because of all the retirements, they've appointed eight more judges after me. So, so I got to be a judge, and then I also get to take all my friends with me on the bench. So it's been a pretty incredible experience. <laughs> and um, they are very supportive of diversity as well. So it's, you know, at first, when I first took the bench, I told one of our senior judges that was retiring, I said to him, it's really depressing to me that you're all leaving because you were all these great mentors to me, and I appeared in front of you, and now you're all retiring. And I said, and so it's really hard because I don't get to be colleagues with you for very long. And he said to me, but you're coming on at such a dynamic time because there's such turnover and these are going to be your colleagues for 20 years. So think about it. This is incredible for you. So that helped me get used to all these retirements that keep coming. And then, like I said, um, I've been lucky that a lot of my really close friends, like at my investiture, there were two of my friends who gave speeches. They both become judges. So, it's pretty awesome. Yes? follow-up, of the eight judges who were appointed after you, what is their gender? 
Okay. Yes. Um, in Multnomah County, we have had um, one black male judge appointed after me, um, and sorry, and then one female black judge, and then the rest have been Caucasian. And I think, in terms of the ratio, I would say it's about 50-50 male female. Yeah. And then I look further in terms of defense or state. Uh, prosecutor's office, defense, or civil, and I think it's been pretty mixed. So, yes. Can you speak a little bit about what I would imagine to be the challenge of maintaining objectivity in working with kids and parents, and you alluded to it a bit, um, in relation to your own background? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think, um, I had such good practice in the last 14 years um, when I was handling the child abuse cases that I had to really uh, disconnect from uh, what any views I may have uh, and really advocate or uh, in the, when I was in the state to really um, pursue certain state goals. Um, and so I feel like um, I was able to really uh, set it aside. Also though, and I'm being really honest here, also um, the judge that was on my case when I was a child forced me to go into a lot of therapy, and I think it was really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can't make, I can't order kids into therapy, but I certainly, as I'm doing the cases, when I have cases with kids who are experiencing what I experienced, um, I check in to see if those supportive services are in place. Because I think that was really significant for me. And I think that because, um, it's something that I think you, you deal with your entire life, and so you process it. But I think that because I processed it from a very early on, uh, from when I was 13 and, until I was 18 and had a uh, therapist the entire time and was really looking at that and doing the work that I think needed to be done. And I think as an adult and um, my CASA was asking me about that because she said a long time ago, I didn't know if you could do those cases and I was always worried about you, but it didn't really seem to affect you. And I think it's, again, I think because I did so much therapy work. And then I also think, interestingly enough, doing the work was therapy because I represented mothers and I represented children who had gone through it and I also represented sex offenders. And so really having all those points of view to really be able to um, see those, you know, the various life experiences and have to zealously advocate very different positions. I think that was therapeutic for me. Hi. Hi. Over here. Yeah. Hi. I'm lost. Sorry. <laughs> I am very geographically challenged. Go ahead. <laughs> Yes. Um, so my mother, I was talking to some students about it earlier. So my mother had started the political asylum application for me before I went into foster care. And then um, once you're in foster care, uh, since you're a ward of the state and the state is your guardian, um, they took over that process. And that still happens nowadays. Um, the Department of Justice, when I was a lawyer at the Department of Justice, we were trained to do those cases. Um, and so uh, when I was in care, um, lawyers for the state finished handling that piece for me, so then they adjusted my status from having no documents to um, having temporary residency, and then it becomes permanent residency. I was telling the students earlier that I was a permanent resident way longer, um, I think seven years after you could become a US citizen. And um, I was telling them how hard it was for me um, because I was born in El Salvador, and I'm really, um, I'm in love with that country, I love the country, it's where I was born, it's my land. Um, so it was hard for me to become a US citizen. I felt like I was betraying that country somehow. And uh, so it took me a long time to do it. And I love this country, and I, this is my country, but uh, it, was, it was hard. And what happened was, I was working for that federal judge, Judge Anna Brown, and 9-11 happened. 
And somehow she got wind of the fact that I wasn't a U.S. citizen. So she sat me down and she said, you need to become a U.S. citizen. Are you crazy? She, and she said to me, and I spoke about this at my investiture, she said, you know, there could come a time where someone can try to impact the rights of a permanent resident, which is something I never envisioned could ever happen. And so, um, and I was saying I was terrified of judges, so I went and became a U.S. citizen because she told me to. <laughs> but also because she's very wise, and what she said, uh, which interestingly enough was happening at the time, or at least there was talk of it, when I became uh, a judge. So um, I took her advice and I did it. Welcome. Yes, hi. Um, I you speak to the qualities you see important in successful CASAs and successful foster parents? Yes. Successful CASAs. I was just I was just meeting with the director of the CASA program in Multnomah County and was talking about this with her. I think that, um, and I'm there now. Uh, it took a long time, but I think that sometimes we're in a position of privilege, and I think that it's hard for us to understand the law. And so the director of the CASA program was asking me, what can we do to help the CASAs? And I said to her, um, you need to explain the law to them. You need to explain that um, children get to go back to their parents if their parents are fit. And while a two-bedroom apartment for six people may not seem like an ideal to that CASA, because maybe they're in a position of affluence, um, that is the best home for the child. Because sometimes the children are placed in foster homes that are amazing, and the kids are going on these amazing trips during the summer and these incredible things, and we get these reports from the CASA saying, oh no, the children should stay there. They build a bond and they're having a great time. And so explaining that sometimes the children are gonna have to go back to their parents, and it's not what we would consider ideal economically, ideal in terms of a home setting, uh, ideal in terms of uh, the lifestyle, uh, and I'm, I'm talking just purely economic, but that's their home. That's the home they know. And um, that's what we're striving for, is to reunite families. And that's the law, is reunification, if possible. Uh, in terms of uh, foster parents, Wow, you know, uh, one of my friends became a foster parent and she's a lawyer and she did it for a long time and I had children that I represented that were placed in her foster home. And she was, uh, she's retiring now, she was an incredible foster parent to watch. She was sort of like a probation officer. <laughs> <laughs> but she had very difficult teens that were running away all the time, children that were on the missing and exploited list, I mean, difficult cases. And so I represented a kid like that, and so she was placed with her. And I never knew um, where this my ring is stuck to my head. This is a new ring. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I never knew where this kid was. I'd go to court, and I had no idea. I hadn't talked to her. I didn't know where she was. She was always checking in with this former foster mom. And so um, her name's Louise Palmer. Louise and I became really good friends. And I watched her, and I watched how she dealt with the children. And you know what she told me? They started with trust in my home. And then, little by little, depending on what they did, they would lose it. But they always knew that when they came into my home, they had complete trust. And I trusted them with everything. And she said, and that made the difference. So that's the advice I would give to foster parents, complete trust, at the beginning. And then you're watching like P.O.s. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story. Um, you mentioned your siblings, and I'm curious if you can talk, if you'd be willing to share with us what their journeys have been, and do you still have relationships with them? Yes, thank you. A lot of people actually asked about that after the first night of the play. Um, so, you know, it was really hard for me as a lawyer um, that the play doesn't get the facts the way that they were because I'm a lawyer. And so I would send this to the playwright all the time, and that was one of them. I'm like, you know, I have two sisters, not one, and they're like, we understand that. Or I would say, you know, this is not exactly how the, I applied four times to be a judge, not three times, and they were like, okay. Uh, and so I needed everything perfect, and they're like, no, this is a play. It's like loosely based on your life. And so uh, not having that other sister in there really killed me. Um, 
So I have, uh, I said two sisters. Um, my eldest sister, uh, she lives in Anaheim, and she works with uh, the elderly. And uh, she started college, but did not finish. She did uh, a year and a half. Um, and I wanted to say that, you know, how I said I, talk, I talked about taking a break from college. Um, in retrospect for myself, I feel like, um, I mean, I was fortunate that I got into Berkeley, but I think in retrospect, I probably would have been better off as a foster kid to have done community college first. Mm -hmm. Because I think if I had gotten the requirements out of the way, Berkeley was a huge institution. I had classes with a thousand people in them. I had um, TAs that I saw and professors that I never spoke to. Um, so it was a tremendous experience. And when you don't have the support that you need, it's quite challenging. And so for me, anyway, I kind of thought maybe community college and then transfer would have been better. Um, but you know, it was an incredible experience to go to Berkeley. So I'm not saying that I would change it necessarily. But sometimes I wonder if the break would have happened if I had gone community college and then transferred. So um, my brother is way more successful than me. Um, he uh, went to college and then he, uh, he started as a truck driver for UPS. He's one year older than me. And then worked his way up. UPS is extremely supportive of their employees, so they paid for Pepperdine for him to get his MBA. And now he is like their mergers and acquisitions of land internationally and lives in Atlanta in her corporate, that's where they have her corporate office. So way more successful than me. So, and then my little sister, um, my little sister's married to a cop. She's six years younger than me. Um, she did not go to college and she is a stay at home mom um, to her children. And she lives in Sacramento. Were they in foster care also? Um, briefly, yes, my brother went back home um, so I think he was in foster care for maybe six months. My little sister uh, went back and then came back into care. And then my eldest sister aged out as well, like me. Uh, my sister and uh, my, three, my two sisters and I briefly, and then my eldest sister and I for some time in some of the homes because I had four placements. Which, thank you for asking about that because the law at the time didn't, uh, and there's a lot in the play about that distance. Um, I wouldn't say we're close, we all talk, but I wouldn't say we're, I think it took, we're learning to be siblings. I think not seeing each other growing up is uh, very difficult and it changes the bond. And so there are laws now in Oregon that require the agency to ensure that their sibling visits are happening. At the time when California, there wasn't such a thing, so I went like, years without seeing them sometimes. So, um, but we try to stay connected, but we always joke, it's like once in a blue moon, like my investiture. So it took being appointed judge for them all to come to Oregon. <laughs> I'm dismayed that there seems to be uh, the need to move foster kids around so much, and I was wondering if you could talk about that. Is that because of the kids, because of the foster parents, um, I, I can see some movement, but four, four different homes? Yes. So for my, I mean, I'll talk personally about my experience. The first foster home was an emergency foster home. And I have to tell you, going back to how I can do this work, um, I had the most skilled initial foster placement. She was a psychologist, and her husband was a police officer. Um, and so I was there, I think, about a month and a half. And then I went into a different foster home, and um, they were very religious, Jehovah Witnesses. And they asked that I be moved. I don't really know why. So I was moved. When my sister was with me. And then um, I think my theory is that I didn't quite take to the church. Um, and I liked gifts. And you're not supposed to accept gifts. <laughs> so I was clearly not right for that religion. <laughs> and um, then I moved to another foster home. And uh, that was actually a very sad circumstance. And it, the play covers it. And, um, uh, my sister attempted to kill herself at that foster home, and not in the home, but while we were placed there. And um, they asked that we be moved. And then I ended up with a foster home the last two years of high school. And that was like the greatest stability I had in terms of foster placements, and that's where I graduated from law school. And so somehow, um, what I did is I studied a lot. That's sort of my escape was to study all the time. That's how I got to Berkeley. So <laughs> that's, um, but like I said, the play covers that. And I think um, 
I debated a lot whether I wanted to leave that in because they snuck it in towards like one of the revisions. And I thought, ooh, I don't know, that's, that's heavy. And I mean, not that the play wasn't heavy already, but I thought that's heavy. Uh, and I, so I thought about um, them taking it out. And then I decided in the end, I'm not gonna have them take it out because sadly, it is a very realistic experience for foster kids. And that's an important story to be told. And so I left it in there. And my sister, like I said, is doing really well. She's, um, she's doing great, actually. So, yes. Okay, maybe one more. Audrey? Yeah. I have been speaking with uh, Newt Bueller, who in his new role as a civilian, um, is very interested in foster care um, in this Oregon area. And I mean, I would love to be able to be part of that, but I don't think I am equipped to deal with the kinds of issues that come with somebody who's been thrown around. But to advocate for that, and what does it take to, to what kind of support do any of these people have who might have the space and the heart to bring in somebody? What kind of peer support? So one of the things that they do is there's respite care so that the children can to go to another foster home maybe on the weekend to give that foster parent a little bit of space. Um, they are looking at rate assessments uh, so that to make sure that um, the stipend that foster parents get is not very much. And so they are looking at rates so that to ensure that you can pay for whatever it is that the child needs, like extra therapy or... Um, and then there are other resources where you can get, like, uh, if a child is really enjoying horse therapy, they can help with that. And so there are resources. There's a foster parent organization that assists with support system. Yeah. But no, I, but you know, interestingly enough, the last foster home I was in, um, my foster parent, and she was a single mother, had adopted a little boy. And she was retired. And so where there's love, there's love. And so I don't think that there's a certain age to be a foster parent, but you're right. I mean, there are some challenges and you have to be prepared. What I would say is if you, anyone's thinking about being a foster parent, the best way that you can educate yourself about any child coming into your home is if the agency has a psychological evaluation done on that child, then you want to ask for that and you want to read it. Because that psychological evaluation is going to give you the best overview of what that child is dealing with better than a caseworker will. And it will be um, comprehensive. And then you will know what possible challenges you may be taking on. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Is that mandated? Because in the county of the Chutes, we don't have that except in certain cases. The psychological evaluations? You know, it's not mandated. What I would say is, you need to be as educated as you can be. And so if you're taking a child into your home and there's a psychological, um, you may insist on it. You, if you want to learn about it. Um, uh, the, the records are confidential, so it's tricky. That's the part, is that the records are confidential. Um, like I wouldn't even, if a, if a parent wanted to read their child psychological, I wouldn't give it to them. But I would allow them to come in and read it because it was part of the court file. Um, so I think if you don't feel like a caseworker is giving you a really honest or comprehensive picture of a child that you're thinking of bringing into your home, then I would strongly suggest you talk to their supervisor and see if you can get more information and if they'll let you read the psychological. Um, there are exceptions in the confidentiality rules, and um, I think that if you're going to be a potential guardian, um, then the agency can let you read about the child's needs. Okay, thank you so much. So mark your calendar, Thursday, May 16th, 6 p.m. in Hitchcock Theater. Uh, the name of the play is Judge Torres. <laughs> we weren't that creative. <laughs> 
I want to tell you about the name of the play, though. Um, so they asked me if I would be okay with it being called that, and I think that they talked about Huesa Torres, which is um, in Spanish. And um, we decided to do Judge Torres, at least in my mind. I don't know if they agreed with my decision about it. But in my mind, it was really nice to have Judge and then a Spanish name next to an English word. So that's why we didn't do Juez. It's Huesa, which is the female for judge. It's really not a real word. Because in Spanish, there is no female judge name. Nor in English, I will add. <laughs>